It's on the board! And is that a checkmate in three by force? This is why we love the World Cup. The top guys beating down on the little guys. This is what we came to see. No more perfect defense from 2750 plus. We want to see Magnus smashing people up, finding brilliancies to finish the game. Now he was playing here against the Georgian player. Let me try and pronounce this. So it's Levan Pantasuleya. So he's from Georgia, 2564. Strong player in his own right, but not in Magnus's league. So Magnus kicks off with C4. He only even needs a draw. He won yesterday, but okay, he's going for a win. So this English opening, symmetrical, and now G6 played. And I like what Black goes for here, which is something a bit different. He knows he'll get positionally crushed against Magnus, so let's try and make it tactical. Now the normal move here is taking that pawn. But instead, Bishop G7 is played, Magnus takes the space, and after d6, we get e4. So a brave decision, giving the world champion the space, the center, but obviously now black is going to play for some dark squared control. Now e6 is played here, we get pawn h3 from Magnus, stopping any future bishop g4, knight e7, knight c3, and pawn h6. You know, a number of pawn moves here from black. I mean, white's made some too, of course, but not exactly a setup that fills you with tons of confidence. But like said, black wants to play for tactics. Now, Magnus doesn't have to do this, but he takes on e6. The computer just wants to develop a bishop, play with the space. But Magnus's idea is bishop f4, target that backwards pawn, and black responds correctly, ditch the pawn, go for counterplay. So Magnus takes it, we get queen a5, pressure on the c3 knight in combination with this bishop. So the bishop drops, uh, sorry, queen drops back, and now knight b4, you know, black trying to start an early initiative. a3 from Magnus, but not yet threatening to take that horse off because the rook is pinned by the pawn, you know, it's loose, it's going to drop. So g5 is flicked in, kicks back this bishop, yes, lovely, Magnus drops it back. Could have gone there, by the way, could have gone there, different ways to play. But it does weaken this f5 square, which could come back to bite. So we see rook d8, kicks back this queen, and now knight d3 check. Really logical idea. You pick up the bishop pair, and after rook recaptures, look at this pawn. About to drop off the board, plus huge pressure on this knight. So what does Magnus do? He castles the king, good move, gets it to safety. Yes, the pawn drops, but now at least he can start to counterattack a bit. So he opens up the queen, attacking that bishop. It chops on d5. The pawn recaptures and rook takes. So now black is the one who's actually a pawn up. What's Magnus is gonna what's Magnus gonna do about this? Well, he goes rook e1. And this stops the Black King from castling. And boy, does this get nasty really fast. So Queen d8 is played to cover the knight, set up this really nice battery, and prepare to castle. But Queen c4 is an excellent move from Magnus. Can you see what happens here if Black castles the king? Can you find the winning tactic? <clears throat> so... The move to play here is rook takes on e7. You remove the defender of this rook, and then white emerges simply a piece up. So castling is impossible. What does black do? King to f8. Step out of the pin, prepare to move the knight, but now another great move from Magnus. Knight to e5, he's just bringing that firepower into the attack. And this rook is now pinned. You know, say for example, you went rook d4 to attack that queen. Well, there's mate in one on f7. And if you eliminate that knight with the bishop, bishop recaptures, say the rook moves here, bishop f6, you're getting killed on these dark squares. It is not fun. So what we see instead is knight to c6. Very logical. You challenge this strong piece. That knight was a bit miserable there anyway. You know, black was really happy to hop it out the way. But now a really nice move from Magnus, rook a to d1. So using the fact that the rook cannot take here or you walk into this checkmate. And of course this tactic's only possible because black's not taking with check. So what should black do in response? Well, it's tough. 
you know, if you take here, well then simply your rook is dropping on d5 because that rook is now attacked. There's a threat to take it, but you can't move it. So what black does is knight d4, <clears throat> good move. Interrupting the connection here, of course. Magnus now sidesteps, coming away from any nasty discovered checks. And now b5 from black, pushing back the white queen, using the powerful knight on d4, but it's really hard to keep these pawns rolling. You know, there's no c4, this knight gets really loose. What do you actually do on the king side here? You want to get this rook into the game. And so h5 is played, you know, an attempt to sort of bring this one, maybe lift it one day or push the pawns forward, activate the rook like that. But watch how Magnus now takes over the initiative. So he starts with knight to c6. More use of tactics, more use of pins. So both of these are attacked. And if you take with the knight, well, again, your rook is dropping. This is the problem. So the queen moves to b6, the knight is attacked, but Magnus doesn't take here. That would be helping black more than it helps white. Instead, he hops with knight e7, and that f5 square is coming back to bite. So the rook drops back and knight f5 played. Still, you can't snap it off. Still, you're then gonna lose um, a rook at the end. And in fact, this is literally a checkmate. You know, Look at the unfortunate position of that king. So instead, we see queen g6 played, pressuring the knight, but it's a huge blunder, which Magnus now pounces on. By the way, running back one move, what should black do? Well, bishop f6 was best, apparently, adding defense to the rook, but okay, not easy to see, under some time pressure as well, you know, down to 10 minutes. So queen g6 played. Now, can you find the winning move here, which Magnus plays, it sets up a beautiful finish. <clears throat> so Magnus plays the move of bishop to c7 and he's trying to dislodge this rook because if the rook leaves the d-file here say it comes to c8 to attack that bishop keep an eye on the back rank well now the bishop nudges back with check it's defended by the knight so the queen can't take the king can't move this way it's completely cut so this is forced and then you check like this and you pick up the queen on the next move. So this is the problem with sidestepping off the D file. If you come to the E file, you know, prepared to maybe chop that knight if it checks from E7 in that whole same sequence. Well, now white can take here. King recaptures and this is an awesome move. Queen takes on B5 with check because if knight captures, this is actually a checkmate. The way the pieces flow and take advantage of this king, not castle, no rook on f8, it's really beautiful. So coming back here, we see the rook slide up to d7, staying on the d file, hitting that bishop, but this is where Magnus unleashes a brilliancy. Tanya reacts to the move like this. I'll show you the clip in a second. If you want to pause the video, look for it, then please do so. <clears throat> So the move that Magnus plays here is rook to e8 check. He sacrifices the rook and this is the response from Tanya. It's on the board! Magnus Carlson with the fantastic rook e8. And is that a checkmate in three by force? So why does this work? Well, the king has to recapture, you know, it's got no other move. And then this is the follow-up, it's queen e4 check not only threatening nasty stuff here, but you're also eyeing the a8 square. This is the key to the variation. Now, if the king moves, it's only got one square to go to, then that's how you finish the game. You check from here, the only legal move is a rook block. This is a checkmate. So if we run it back here, the king can't move away. Well, what if you block the check? There's three ways to do so. If you block with the rook, that's mate in one. If you block with the knight, then you still check from the back rank, the rook blocks, and now this piece joins the party because you take with check, knight recaptures is forced, and this is a checkmate. That's the second one in terms of the blocking. And now if you block with the queen, the third possible block, same thing, check from back here, rook blocks, that's a mate on the board. Really nice finish, and remember from this game, always get your king to safety, cardinal sin. 
So this is Ramesh Babu Pragnananda, otherwise known as Prag. Now he's 17 years old, a chess prodigy from India, and he's just played what's gonna go down, I reckon, as the greatest attack of the Chess World Cup 2023. It's undoubtedly the greatest so far. Will it be surpassed? I doubt it. Now he was playing today in round two of the FIDE World Cup, a World Cup event that takes place every two years. His opponent was the French, uh, Frenchman Maxime Lagarde, not to be confused with Maxime Vachier Lagrave, MVL, the 2700 player. This guy is about 2599, right? Very strong player in his own right, but what Prague unleashed on the board today will go down in history. So e4 on the board, and Prague goes with his favourite, King's Pawn Defence. We now get the two knights developing, and Bishop b5 pressures this one, which is defending the pawn. Now, knight g7 was played by Prague, and it's a rare move. It's known as the Cozio or Cozio defence. You know, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. Now, normally at top level chess, you see that knight coming to f6. So what does black have in mind? Well, after knight c3, the knight spins to g6, where it still defends the pawn, but also looks at some other ideas. Now, white seeks to punish this, as we're going to see. First off, d4 is played. White looks to explode the center, take advantage of the fact that black's moved that knight two times already. So knight takes on d4 played, white takes here, this is all theory, and now c6 kicks back this bishop and queen b6 played by Prague. So that's a powerful centralized queen, you know it's eyeballing down here, you can't develop the bishop until it moves, so it now nudges back, white wants to keep the queens on the board, that is the best move. We get bishop e7 and now the white player, Maxime Lagarde, he goes his own way because the main way to go here is with castles slowly prepare f4 but what does he do well f4 all in one move and he's just trying to punish the positioning of this knight so he's taken away the e5 square and now watch his follow-up moves so we get castles from Prague and now pawn h4 threatening h5 he just wants to absolutely squash this knight, you know, force it back to a miserable square. Now, he is offering her pawn, her pawn here, uh, Maxime Lagarde. So if you take with the bishop, well then there's pawn g3, and it's not good for black. Because the bishop drops back, you're losing critical tempos, and now something like pawn b3 is a great move. Preparing to bring that bishop to the long diagonal, castle, queenside, huge attack. And coming back here, if you take with the knight, well then there's queen g3. And there's similar problems, you know, after the knight backpedals, there's something like f5, the knight's getting squashed, huge attack, no good. So Prague doesn't touch the pawn, he plays pawn to d5. And if you remember nothing after this game but this, then remember that if you're getting attacked on the flank, look to counter in the centre. Very thematic idea. So white now carries on with the plan. Now it's actually the wrong move. Technically takes on d5 should be played first. But this pawn was pushed on, very logical, playing with the plan, but now Prague. He flicks in this takes on e4 and it's actually a nasty move to me. Because if you play the really natural knight takes on e4, well now this knight h4 is a problem. Because this square has been freed up, so the knight can retreat back, you know, the pawn is gone. And say you carry on with queen g3, which you'd like to do, look to attack, pressure the knight, well then there's queen b4 check. The knight is loose, it's got to drop back, knight f5, you know, huge position. Now, white doesn't have to play queen g3 here, there are other moves, but you know, king f1 is top here. Pretty miserable move, defending the pawn, not what you want. So taking with the knight, not ideal, and if you take with the queen, now there's bishop h4 check, but there's no pawn g3, the queen doesn't support it, again, really bad for white. So, the queen slid to g3, ignored this pawn, the knight's still under attack, where is the knight moving to? You know, these squares are taken, is it coming back here? Well, no, 
Prague just charges forward here by putting the knight on h4, even though it can be captured, and after the rook captures, he doesn't even take back that piece with the bishop, because if you do, queen recaptures, well now when you flick in this check, which we see in the game, the bishop can block, and if you try and carry on the attack, well you just haven't got enough pieces. Knight e2 is coming, queen f2, the queen's going to get evicted or traded off, the attack fizzles out, white's doing great. So what does Prague do? Well he checks immediately, leaving the rook on prees. Bishop f1 blocks, and now a stunning move, the star move of the game in my opinion, we see the pawn now kick on to e3. This is the image from the thumbnail. Now it's such an amazing move because you're actually allowing white to save this rook if they want to do so. But the problem with this is bishop to c5 and it's just a crushing quiet move that Prague talked about after the game. Because if white now carries on with knight to e2 to evict this queen, well it can come to f2 with check, queen takes, pawn takes, this is the main line, and because you force the king to the d file, it gets cut to shreds. Now if you come to d1, it's terrible. Check, bishop blocks, and this one's a killer. You're winning back the material, and then some. It's minus 15 here, for reference. And coming back here, if instead you step to d2, we'll still check, king c3, and now this is the position that Prague talked about in an interview after the game. Should be decent for black, and he's absolutely correct. It's about uh, minus three, you know, three pawns up for black. The problem for white is all of these development issues, plus the exposed king. So it makes up enough for the piece, and of course there's this amazing pawn on f2. So we didn't see the rook try and rescue itself, we saw knight d1, excellent defensive try, attacking this pawn, covering this square, and now a really calm move from Prague, continuing the pressure, rook to e8. So he's saying, I dare you to take this pawn, if you do, you're opening the e-file to my rook. Now the computer gives the best move here as well, you can play bishop f5, or you can even take this one now, queen takes, then you can even crash through here, you know, you've now decoyed that queen away. Um, I'd click through similar lines here, but not this exact one. But you get the idea, you know, queen's gone, now this piece is dropping, so you just can't open the e-file to that rook. So instead, we see king e2 played because there are also some ideas of pushing on that pawn, ripping open the e-file. So the king blockades, you know, the bishop couldn't do it, pinned by the queen. And now bishop e6, another calm killer move by Prague, still not taking the rook, because bishop c4 is a huge and lethal, uh, lethal threat. So what should white do? Well, f5 is actually best to open up the rook's defense, but, you know, we're human, not perfect, right? So Lagarde goes pawn b3 to cover that square, but the problem with this one is he opens this diagonal in a really nasty way. So Prague starts with rook a to d8. I love how he brings all his forces into the attack. So, so instructive. Now the knight does capture, and this is the top move, but it's a brave move, right? You know, you're opening up both of these cannons, they're blasting down to your king, I say I'm, I'm misfired, so I'll misfire both, right? And now Prague, he starts to open them up. So he goes bishop f6, hitting this unprotected rook in the corner. We can see one of the problems of b3. The rook saves itself, and now this move is really stunning. So bishop f5, it uses the fact that the knight is pinned, attacks this pawn, and sets an amazing trap. I mean, I shouldn't say that this move is stunning, but the idea behind it, the bit that comes next. So best for white here is to apparently go rook b2 and cover the pawn, but then you're literally hanging a rook, you know, it's not good. Um, no, wait, sorry, you're not meant to take straight away, what does the computer say? Oh, take this rook first. Okay, it gets quite complicated, right? So many lines, but black's really winning. But what Prague does here is set the trap, white falls for it by going queen to f2. So looking to trade off the queens, what could be more natural? You're fed up with that one, you wanna consolidate, use your extra material in the long run. But this is the move that white would have missed. Can you see the best move for Prague, the response that he played? <clears throat>
So the move he played here was bishop takes on h4, finally eliminating that rook. Now, why is this so beautiful? Well, if white takes that black queen, then there's a checkmate in one move. Again, pause if you want to look for it. Maybe you found it on the previous move already. So the move you play here is bishop g4, that's check and mate. I mean, look at how these snipers just cut the king off, plus in combination with the rook, and this rook, because the knight is pinned, cannot take the bishop. I mean, that's one hell of a checkmate, right? But we didn't see it on the board. Of course, white sees this, so they take the bishop, but Prague said his opponent was shaking his head. You know, he'd missed this idea. And now after bishop takes on c2, the house of cards is really starting to crumble. So the rook attacked. And if you do something like this to save it, well, bishop d3 is a real killer move. King f3 played, then you pick up the bishop, and now black is even a head material and still a raging attack. Won't keep going deeper, but it's really, really bad for white. So what we see instead is the queen taking on d8, and it's a nice try from white, because now, after the rook recaptures, the knight is no longer pinned, so you can pick up this bishop on c2, you've got rook and minor piece for the queen, and when you do a material count here, you've got three minor pieces for the queen, and obviously the rooks match up against each other. <clears throat> so normally, three minor pieces for a queen would be quite favourable. The minor pieces win out. If they can find outposts, coordination, and the king can get relatively safe. But none of those things are true in this position, and so black is better. So Prague starts with queen c5, instantly attacking one of those loose pieces. The knight jumps to e3, rook e8, pins that knight, and Prague just not rushing things right, improving pieces, not snapping this pawn yet. So, so instructive. So king f3 was played, unpinning the knight. We now see queen d4, still not going for this pawn, you know, threatening queen e4 check, picking up the loose rook on b1. So the king steps back. We see a repetition, king f3, and now Prague takes the pawn. Pawn g4 played, queen h1 check, and there's just so many tactics in the air. You know, if you block here with the bishop, <clears throat> then there's a problem with that piece because now the rook can crash through here, and if king takes, the bishop drops, this is a winning end game. If the bishop takes, then the rook drops, again, it's a winning end game. So we didn't see bishop g2, we saw king g3. Prague now lifts this rook into the game. We see bishop d2 trying to complete development, and pawn h5. Such a standard kind of idea to get at the king. You know, you use the pawns, you throw the kitchen sink, try and get more checks and exposure for those heavy pieces. So white takes, you know, there were threats here or possibly just ripping things open. White takes on their own. The queen recaptures, rook e1 now played, rook g6 check, king f2, queen h4 check, the king steps up, another check, the king getting forced out into the open, and now really instructive once again. So often beginner chess players will just give checks wherever they can, but sometimes these kind of moves are the most deadly and killer moves. Silent, cutting the king, creating threats, and here white crumbles. So the best move here apparently is bishop c3, closely followed by bishop b4, but some kind of dark squared bishop move, right? You know, it is attacked. But what white does is defend that bishop, and this leads to mate in three. So can you find how black, Pragnananda, finish the game here? We saw resignation on the next move, just a fitting finish. So the move he played was pawn f5 check, and it forced resignation. So if you take that pawn with the knight, well, this is the finish. Forces the king up the board, and then you've got this nice checkmate using the fact that the king is blocked off here. And if we come back one move or one or two moves, if instead of taking with the knight, you take with the king, well, then you give a different kind of runaround. Again, this pawn, you know, blocks the retreat. King e5, and this is the mate. So this is the final position. What an absolutely phenomenal game from Pragnananda. It's round four of the Chess World Cup 2023. Fabiano Caruana sits down opposite Ray Robson, an All-American clash, August 10th, 
and what's about to unfold is one of the greatest games of Fabi's career. Check this one out, you don't want to miss the sacrifices at the end. So we see e4 played, Ray goes e5, and Fabi develops the knight, Ray does the same, and bishop c4, the Italian game. Knight f6 on the board, knight g5 possible, d5 then comes, different line, but Fabi goes d3, bishop c5, and c3, preparing a later d4, sometimes even b4. We get d6, castles, now Ray decides to push that rook's pawn, gives his bishop some retreat room. We see rook e1, the bishop drops back, prophylactically preparing for d4, and now knight bd2 from Fabi, he starts maneuvering very standard stuff. Ray flicks in h6, you're gonna see Fabi do the same soon. Knight f1, castles, knight g3, and Ray now starts maneuvering his knight with knight e7, preparing c6, maybe d5. H3 now flicked in, knight g6, Fabi drops his bishop back, and after bishop e6, offering an exchange, Fabi says no, he tucks it back here, looks counterproductive to stare at your own pawns, but d4 is coming, this one adds some protection here, it's kind of a coiled spring, you know, there's a latent threat in the position for white to open up, bring the pieces to life. And now this is an interesting moment, because d5 is a big candidate move. But one of the problems here, sorry, bishop b3 first, you can actually chop these bishops, then go d4 in favorable circumstances because the queen's opposite the rooks, it's a little bit better for white, bit uncomfortable. So because Ray's not going d5 himself, he goes c5 to play against the d4 break, but it looks a bit ugly. These pawns, both on dark squares, you've just weakened b5 a lot, shut out the bishop, but Ray does see that it's gonna come to life after Fabi goes d4, we get captures, and now queen b6. Weird looking move to stand in front of the bishop like that. Something about it just looks a bit ugly, but it has a very concrete threat, which is simply to win a pawn. And you can't take or advance, or you're simply opening this diagonal and you've got a big problem there. So what does Fabi do to cover the pawn? Well, bishop e3 is forced but then you give a pawn, which Ray grabs. What's going on here? Now, rook b1 is such a natural looking follow-up, you know, offering the second pawn, but then you break through here, and the computer says that white is a bit better, but Fabi goes for the most precise move of bishop to b3. Now, this is an interesting moment, because we see this one captured, and it gives up the f5 square, which begs the question, what if you go queen a3, top computer move, you know, bringing the queen back into the game or so, well, now if white takes here, pawn recaptures, yes, you've now covered the square, but there are some weaknesses now that could be targeted, and the computer says white is slightly better, even though a pawn down, because you can long-term target these bits, but you really have to know what you're doing. So that's one way the game could have gone, but we see takes here, pawn recaptures, and after queen c3, trying to escape with the queen, d5 technically best by the way, but very complicated, well Fabi now jumps with his knight into f5, the square vacated once this bishop gave up its control, and now this queen drops back, covers the pawn, but Ray has missed a shocking attack from nowhere for Fabi, but this is thematic. What do you think Fabi played here to crash through? The thumbnail maybe gives it away a bit, right? So the move played is bishop takes on h6, smashing open that king position, and queen d2 is the follow-up. Very simple threat. Queen takes on h6, queen g7 mate. And it's really hard to defend against because all the pieces kind of stand on top of each other, stopping any lateral defense. So knight f4 is forced, it was played, it shuts out that queen, but g3, simple stuff. Get rid of the knight, carry on the attack. And if you take here with check, well king g2 and you're getting nowhere. The knight has to go back, or if you go here, you can still smash things up, you know, you're coming in, delivering mate. So we see this knight jump to the edge of the board, support the other one, and now Fabi simply takes. He wins back his piece. 
and goes king h1 to start using that open g file. So black side steps with the king. And now rook takes on a5 is simply incredible because watch what's coming now. This is what makes the game special. After bishop b6 attacking that rook, opening this one to exchange, can you guess what Fabi played here to finish the game with a swashbuckling combination? <clears throat> so the move he plays is pawn takes on e5 and Ray must have just completely overlooked the power of this because if bishop captures and now you're skewering here well the queen takes on f4 and you're just absolutely dead you know this is a threat to go mate in two so if pawn f6 to add the queen's protection to this square well there's different ways actually to lead to checkmate apparently this one is the fastest and now takes on d6 there are other good moves there but this puts a question to the queen the computer actually wants to go king f7 as a top move give the queen but what if you slide over challenge the white queen well now you can check from the g file the king goes and can you see how white actually finishes the game here really really nice mating idea quite a good pattern to know so the way you do it is you actually chop the queens off, king recaptures, check with the rook, and because of the power of that knight, the king is forced backwards, and now to shut the trap on the king, you bring the second knight into the game, and black is completely powerless to stop this check. Make any move you want, that check's coming, and it's actually mate. Beautiful one, you know, this is an example. So coming back here, this is why you cannot take this rook. This is too much of a powerful threat. So the pawn recaptures, still covering the knight, but what does Fabi do to finish? Well, this one not so hard to find. This pawn simply on prees now, so rook captures, supported by the knight so the queen can't take. Now the knight's about to drop, and if it moves out of the way, we take here with check and mate. You know, this is absolutely game over. No f6 anymore, you know, not only can you take, but then there's even things like rook e7 check coming. It's all just terrible, completely collapsing. So coming back here, this was the final position. What an exceptional game by Fabi.